Um, you, you will know that uh, we had uh, mostly uh, top scientists coming from the Hebrew University, but there are other places in Israel where uh, high level of uh, scientific research is being uh, done. One of those places is uh, the Weizmann Institute in Rehobot. Um, many very important uh, scientists and also Nobel Prizes, Nobel laureates uh, come from there. Um, the next lecture is Professor Benjamin, Benjamin Geiger. He was the Dean of the Faculty of Biology at Weizmann Institute. He's really one of the leaders in his field. He's an expert on how cells interact with, with their microenvironment which we know today there is a critical issue in, for example, differentiation and cell specification and uh, cell cycle. Uh, so um, please, Professor Geiger, thank you very much. Do you hear me? You do. So my... My good old mother used to tell me that uh, the few things that I should never do. I should never compete with food, which is outside the hall, as you, you could see. And uh, I should never speak around 12 o'clock, which is for many people the time that the brain is shut down and the intestine is, is turned on. So, so uh, Unfortunately, I have to defy these criteria, and I hope that uh, the topics will, will keep you interested. Uh, so I looked through the programs that you had, which is truly very, very impressive. <coughs> Sorry. Very, very impressive, and um, I'm sure also very exhausting. And uh, I hope that you'll be able to take uh, this lecture, and for some of you, uh, we'll continue discussions also a little bit later. So, the, the, subject, the subject that I'm going to try to dwell on today, or this, this uh, noontime, is, has to do with, if you wish, the social behavior of cells. Now, the social behavior of cells is not just a nice title, but it's, it's something which is very, very real. Somewhere around 600 million years ago, or a bit later, a bit, a bit longer, uh, very primitive forms of life, mostly unicellular forms of life, started to cluster together and form organisms that are multicellular, that are made of not of a single cell, but made of many cells sometimes a few, sometimes really a huge number of cells. And uh, from that point and on, one of the challenges of biological organisms was to create a very interesting type of, of society. I don't know if you ever sort of thought about this in this way, but uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, all organisms, all living organisms are made of cells and in multicellular organisms there are many of them but each one of them basically contains uh, the same or very very similar genetic information. So, so the list of instructions, the list of, of, of information encoded in the DNA is essentially identical in all cells but in a multicellular organism, not all the same, have the same function. Uh, in, in, in many ways, the reason and the, the motivation, uh, evolutionary motivation, to start forming multicellular organisms was a need for specialization of specific functions, uh, like protection and getting food, and digesting the food and distributing different, different metabolites, etc., which can be ideally or perfectly or, or in the most efficient way done when cells specialize on it, and different cells can specialize in organism on different functions. So that, was, that is a common view of, of how multicellular organisms evolved. 
Uh, but here we have, of course, an interesting dilemma. I mean, we have many, many cells which are supposed to have somewhat different functions, but they all have the same information to perform it, so you have to go through specific processes of selective or differential differentiation of different cells within the organisms, and then cells have to occupy within the organism very, very specific uh, forms. So here we have, if you wish, a society of cells. The cells are all created equal in many ways because they have the same information and they start from the same initial, initial origin, the fertilized egg. Uh, but they have, they have diverse functions. And there should be very strict rules of how such society can and should behave. And uh, if, if uh, just to give you a very simple, perhaps, uh, perhaps almost uh, absurd type of example, imagine that you take a billion cells, a billion people, and you place them on one plane, on one big, big lot, and you then give them an instruction. There are billion people now on this plane, and you give them an instruction to give hands and form a certain shape. Let's say form a cross or a square or a Star of David or whatever you like. Something very simple, extremely simple. And, and the question is, how can they do it? How, do, how does a person in the, somewhere in the middle of the slot knows whether he or she should go to the north or to the south or to the east or to the west? To whom should one engage with the hands? And, and where will the shape be, actually? At, at what location? And, and the reason is that, uh, that for that is that there is no information in this kind of message that I, I described to you that indicates or gives a specific set of instructions to the people what to do step by step to form, to form the shape. And this is something which organisms actually have. And they have it by creating or by developing systems within simple, small, individual cells that tells them at all times where they are. There is a readout that indicates to them when, where they are located at any given moment in time. And obviously, if, if each of us would have had some kind of a shape that should be formed by this billion people, and there was some kind of a GPS indication where you are, you could go to the right place, and you could do this. The question is, how do cells sense the environment, draw conclusions from this, develop some signaling processes due to this signals that are obtained from the environment and, and, and then convert them into a working plan, into a specific fate map that indicates how the organism will develop and how the cells in the different places will, will, will actually function. Now this is a very, very demanding mission. And the truth is that now, uh, after I would say close to 100 years where such questions have been approached in most primitive, in more primitive way uh, at the beginning in very sophisticated ways today, uh, we're still trying to learn not exactly necessarily how uh, the organism is developing in great detail, but what are the basic features that cells can sense in the environment and how they can convert what they sense into a specific mission. So, so if we are, so, so the, the, the main topic, the main focus of this talk will be the sensory activity of cells, trying mainly to show you what, and to some, in some cases, how cells can actually sense things that happen around them. Now, if we, we talk about s sensory functions and, and sensory processes, we are all familiar with senses. We have the, the five classical senses, which are hearing and sight and touch and smell and taste, which most organisms uh, have. The 
just a second. Yeah. Which, which cells have, as you can see here. And uh, some of them are typically, if you want to think about them, are mechanical in nature, like, like hearing and sight and touch. They are based on physical interaction, uh, like uh, with light or with uh, sound waves or with actual bodies around you and applying force to them. And some of them are chemical. Uh, they can, they can uh, figure out a material outside by smelling it or by tasting it because the chemistry is inducing some specific uh, effect within the cell. So, so these are the senses, and as I mentioned, uh, the, so, the societal paradigm of the organism uh, is suggesting to us that some kind of homologues or analogues to these processes do exist or should exist in an organism that need to function in a coordinated fashion and will try to figure out what they are. So what we can assume from the very beginning is that cell have to sense a microenvironment in order to maintain functionality both of the cell itself and for sure of the entire organism as a unit. Now I'm sure that you, you have heard about evolutionary consequences, evolutionary processes, evolutionary considerations. Uh, and the important thing to remember always is that uh, optimization of an evolutionary process is usually determined not by the single cell uh, within an organism, but by the organism, the entire organism itself. The organism that if it survives, then there is a persistence of the species, and if it doesn't survive, everything is terminated. So the cells in this case are elements which are selected most likely through the benefit that they bring to the whole organism. And I'm not sure if you had any lecture that dealt with programmed cell death. Did you? Did you hear about programmed cell death? No. But programmed cell death is an example that it is very often a very critical process in certain cells, which is, you could say, not good for the cell. I mean, the cell is dying. Nevertheless, it is essential for development. And for example, if I have five fingers in my hand, I have them because at some level in my development, cells that were located in between the area between the fingers died off and left the fingers uh, functional elements which are long and can do the functions that fingers are doing. So, so the, the, the selection is based really on the benefit for the whole organism and we try to understand in that context what is happening. So the question uh, of what, what the cells can sense uh, is not, not trivial and I'll try to give you a few examples that at least deal with a few a few variables in the environment that the cells can figure out. One of them, uh, well, let's, let's perhaps start from the end. One of them is a chemistry. Uh, this, like chemical sensation of smell and taste, cells can sense the chemistry of their environment, both soluble molecules that are located around them and molecules that are forming part of the body, of the solid body uh, with which individual cells interact. And we'll try to give you an example and demonstrate to you that cells can actually sense it by doing experiments that can demonstrate it. And there are some physical uh, aspects like the distance between different molecules that the cell can interact. If there are chemi chemical molecules, proteins that the cells can bind to, the question is how they are organized in space. The cells can tell that. The cells can uh, look at the microtopography of a surface. They can figure out if they are located on a surface which is smooth or it's a hilly or mountainous surface relative to the size of the cell. The cells can figure out if they are located on a rigid surface or on a soft surface. And only when all the parameters in the environment are the right parameters, the cells are functioning uh, in, in, in a normal fashion. Now, how can we 
uh, humble biologists who are trying to figure out what cells are doing, how do we know that the cell are actually sensing something? And we can figure out that they do sense by looking at the response. Now they're not going to tell us anything because they cannot speak, but they can show us that when you put them, uh, when we put them in, in different conditions, like these that I show here, there can be changes in their proliferation. They can divide more rapidly or more slowly. They can differentiate in certain direction or they can avoid differentiation. They can migrate and they can even die. For some reason, not simply because it's inconvenient, but because under those conditions they're not supposed to be there. They're not supposed to function. Now, if you, if you sort of pay attention to this sort of list, which is not the, the full list, a uh, list of responses, you can, I believe, figure out that the study of the environment is not only important in order to understand how the organism is built and is functioning, but it, it can also have very, very concrete uh, importance for, for example, from development of medical devices. For example, if uh, we all know that many people suffer from heart that is not functioning properly, and one of the major causes of death, at least until the last years, were heart failures of different types, some of which cause destruction of part of the heart. The heart does not get enough blood, certain area in the heart degenerates, and the heart as, as a whole, as an organ, does not function efficiently, which is dangerous and in some cases can kill the person. Uh, so, so obviously it would be very, very useful to develop a device, to develop some kind of an implant that can be located within the heart that can replace the area that was damaged. All this part of medicine is called collectively regenerative medicine. And in regenerative medicine, you want to have an implant that not only will be able to replace the damaged tissue, but will also be able to function in that region. So for example, an area that will contract together with the rest of the heart, because only under those conditions it will make any kind of benefit. Uh, so, so we need to take cells that come either from the heart or stem cells that, that you harvest in other locations and put them on some kind of scaffold that we have to design very carefully so that the cell will feel at home under those conditions and will develop into contracting heart cell. So this information is important for our understanding of biology, but it's also very important for understanding the, the uh, medical uh, processes that can be developed uh, through it. Now there are also many health issues that play an important role uh, in demonstrating the importance of reading the environment, uh, which is the development of the embryo and wound healing, immune responses, and in cases of diseases, something like metastasis. So, so this idea of order uh, between cells and localization of the cells started in a way in a set of studies in the uh, late 50s or the beginning of the 50s initially uh, and, and developed all, all throughout the 50s by developmental biologists who try to see how embryos develop. And one of, of, one of the groups, the groups of Taus and, and, and Holtfretter, which, uh, which is a summary of the, the experiment is shown over here, did a very simple experiment. They took um, one, an amphibian embryo that at certain early stage in the development has two areas which are very distinct. Here at the top, this is the area which will form the nervous system. And initially the nervous system forms some kind of a tube, some kind of a nerve tube, uh, that usually have a form which is similar to what you see over here in the middle. Uh, this is not the normal situation, but I mean, it looks like that. And there is the rest of, of the area, which is, will form the rest of the outer coating of the body, the epidermis. So uh, what can be done, I mean, such an, an early embryo, the size is approximately a millimeter, millimeter and a half. That's big enough in order to do some surgery. So what, what they did was they cut out 
part of the neural plate and they cut out part of the epidermal cells and they have dispersed the cells. They added some enzymes that loosen the contact between the cells and, and, uh, and got a, a cells that actually could be distinguished even by their color in this particular case uh, and they mixed them over here and, and made a little pile and then they put some medium so that the cells can get oxygen properly and get some food um, and they saw that the cells started to bind to each other and initially formed some kind of a sphere and then left it, went home uh, go to sleep for a day or two and came back and checked what happening and that was pretty interesting so they looked at all the balls and initially they saw that there were white cells and, and dark cells on the outside when they came after two days uh, they saw that all the cells were dark cells they didn't see the white cells so the first feeling was that the, died, the white cells simply died out didn't survive and disappeared but that was not the case when they cut it open and they looked inside, they found them organized differently. So what happened was that the cells managed to sort out from each other. Some cells remained on the outside just as they are in the embryo. And some of them formed some, something that looks very much like a neural tube inside this ball. This is not an embryo. It will never develop into anything. But the rules of the game where the cells have to move around uh, from one place to the other and, and then form a structure which is dictated in their genes to be formed in the developing embryo. And, and they, they were very happy with, the, with this result and they started this kind of, of experiment with taking cells from different origins within the embryo and got a very, very um, interesting variety of monsters, little monsters, none of which is a real embryo, but they form structures that are very similar to what you see in the developing embryo. So the cells know where they are. The cells are moving to a place where they can function. They are not intermixing, they are smart. They know how to sort. They know where to go, they know where to be. So, so this was an old experiment that was really uh, uh, performed uh, about, about uh, 60 years ago. And uh, what I try to give you are mostly studies of the last several years with a lot of technologies that you may have heard about or you may have not heard about. So I, I apologize from the beginning. I will here and there stop for a minute to explain to you what is a technology which is being used because without understanding the technology, you cannot really critically evaluate the results. So one, one technology which is very common today is the use of what we call intrinsically fluorescent proteins. Did you hear about that at all? Uh, you heard it? You heard. You did. Excuse me? Yeah, well, the, the, f the initial finding uh, which gave three smart people a Nobel Prize uh, was that there are organisms that fluoresce in the dark. Most of them you find in marine creatures uh, which operate under very uh, subdued light or very, very specific types of, of colors of light. And uh, it allows the organisms to find I mean, the, the, uh, each other and attract sometimes prey, etc., etc. And that is done by having proteins that bind to specific small molecules and become fluorescent. Become fluorescent, namely you shine on them light, they shine back in a, in a longer wavelength. And uh, since these are proteins that do it, you can get the genes for these proteins. And if you'll express these genes in an, another organism, they will still be fluorescent. So if you take a fluorescent protein from a jellyfish, a marine jellyfish, and you put it into human or into tobacco plant, it will be fluorescent. And in this particular case, a fluorescent protein that uh, is located uh, normally um, in the nucleus became fluorescent by fusing the fluorescent protein with a molecule that is normally located in the nucleus. So you can see here the nuclear division, for example, was put into a drosophila embryo. And what you see here, uh, with a very sophisticated kind of microscopy, you look at an early de 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 development of the embryo from four angles. I mean, this is a microscope 
that has capability of looking simultaneously from different, lo different directions on, on the embryo. So, so this is a view which is at zero degrees, 90, 180, and 270 uh, of the same embryo. And if you look now on what's happening, you can see that there are divisions of the nuclei. They divide and divide. The cell, they, there are more and more cells. And then we start to have a very, very dramatic set of events where we can already see that this is where the head will be, this is where the back will be, this is where the nervous system will form, and you can see this from the different angle. This is, of course, similar to this, simply looking on the embryo from the other side, and, and you can see uh, how the development is occurring. So you have here a whole variety of new cells located in different locations, and under these conditions, the cells in this region have already a very, very different fate from the cells that are located at the other end. And to do that, the cells have to respond to changes that occur within the developing embryo. Now, what is the way a cell can sense its environment? To sense the environment, you need somehow to form contact with the environment, especially if you want to sense it locally. So for example, if some of you will open uh, at the end of this hall, a bottle of, say, perfume. I may be able, from here, perhaps, if I'm very, very sensitive uh, to, to, to smell, I will be able to figure out that there is a perfume uh, of that kind in the room, and I may even have some kind of a general feeling of from which direction uh, the smell is coming, in which area this, the, the, the perfume uh, will be, and obviously, if you go to um, creatures that are more sensitive than humans in, 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 in smell, I mean, they will be able to find out uh, very precisely if somebody holds uh, have some kind of explosives or, or a drug, uh, identify it's within a bag by stopping near the bag with, you know, dogs like that, that, that are smelling specific features, specific materials are being used by, by, by armies, by polices, and so on and so forth. So you can get information with different, di different creatures with different precision. But the precision is limited. The precision is not a precision that is a precision of a size of a cell, which is usually the size is, is just a few micrometers. Uh, 10 to 100 micrometers, sometimes less than 10 micrometers. And micrometer, obviously, you know, is a thousand, one, one of thousands of, of, of a millimeter. So, so cells sometimes need better instructions. And to have better instructions, you need very, very specific instruction locally. You actually need to touch the area around you in order to know what's on it. So if, if I would not be able to see anything in the cells, there's no indication that has visual capabilities. If I want to know what's on this table, I have to make contact with different regions in the table and, and sense what is located on it. And the sensing, the contact formation, is done through specific sites within cells that are called cell adhesions. And the most famous one and most intensively studied are structures called focal adhesions. Uh, for the re simple reason that the, that, uh, that the adhesion is not dispersed over the whole cell surface, but located in specific, very specific sites. It was sort of first noticed in the late 60s uh, of the 20th century. And if you take a cell and cut it and look at it uh, by electron microscopy, you can see that this is one cell here. There is a cell over here, which is forming contact with this cell along this region over here. But if you look at the interface between the cell and what's under the cell, you can see that there is some kind of a thick foot uh, with some dense material near it. If you cut it and look at it by electron microscopy, you see that there are fibers, there are filaments in this region. And this area is the area where the contact is taking place. So this is the area where the cells attach to the, to the matrix around them. And this is also the area where the sensing uh, is, is done. And here again, using the same trick I mentioned before by taking a fluorescent protein, in this case a protein that is normally located in the adhesion site, and I will now refer mostly to the adhesion sites as, as, as the main topic of my talk. Uh, they look at the adhesion site, you can see that they are focal, you can see that they have some kind of a shape of an arrowhead, 
and they're located in different regions within a cell. And if you make a movie of such, of such a cell, you can see that cells can make and break these adhesions. You can see that the cell in this case is moving from one region to the other. It has a tail. It has a region that can choose direction of movement to the left, to the right, or forward. And the movement is most, in most cases, carried out by uh, attaching to the matrix with these structures, pulling on them, and then moving forward. I'll be talking about migration in, in the second talk, and I'm not going to elaborate. But uh, we have found these structures in, in, the, in the 70s, worked on them, identified molecules that are located in them, realized that there are different cells have different forms of such adhesions. You can see structures very similar to what I just showed you over here in cells that are specializing in making a lot of connective tissue. You have very, very long structures like that, cells that are moving very quickly we have very tiny adhesions at the cell periphery and cells that are destroying their environment for some specific purposes, for example, for remodeling the environment, have a fourth type of, of such adhesion. So here, in principle, you have four different machines made all together from more or less the same components uh, in different cell types. Excellent. So, so these cells are formed mostly at the edge of or these the structures are formed at the edge of a cell and they mature and develop into these adhesive structures. And one of the interesting findings was that they are not just adhesions between the membrane and the external world. They are inside the cell connected to big fibers. Uh, uh, that are formed within the cell that are collectively called cytoskeletal fibers or cyto the cell cytoskeleton. Uh, in this case, it is a cytoskeleton that is made predominantly from one type of molecule, a molecule called actin, which you might have heard about as one of the major components of muscle, but also from a force generating, a force generating component within essentially all living cells. So the structure is normally developing at the edge of a cell, where the cell is moving. It is capable of, of growing a tail of actin uh, at its backside. This tail of actin is starting to pull on that structure, and when the structure is being pulled on, it is growing in size and becomes a very, very robust adhesion. Now the robust adhesion obviously has a function that is derived from its capability to bind. It can bind the cell to a specific location and determine its, spe its special distribution, which is an important feature in building the body. But at the same time, it is also a major, major sensory feature. So since we're talking about the, the cell senses, uh, we have to to now distinguish, and I have to give you a few examples, which I'll elaborate on, uh, of how cells is doing this. So as, as I mentioned, there, are, there is a chemical sensing. The chemical sensing means that if you put different molecules on the matrix around the cell, the cell will behave differently. And there are physical uh, features, like forces, or rigidity, or density of, of binding molecules, or geometry of the outer surface, or topography of the outer surface. All of these can be sensed by the cell. And again, sensed means that they can change the behavior of a cell and the changes the fate of a cell. So what are the challenges? The challenges that we as researchers have to face if we want to understand such complicated structures. First, the challenge that is coming from the fact that biology is complicated field. It's complicated by the fact that there are many, many matrix molecules. Many molecules outside the cell, the cell can recognize. And when we talk about adhesion, then the question is adhesion to what? That's like asking somebody if she or he like food. 
Okay, I mean, we all have to eat because, I mean, to, in order to survive. But the question about if we like food or not, we like certain foods, we don't like other foods. So, so there, is, there is the adhesion, is a very general term. The specificity can be very, very significant, very, very high. I'll just give you one example to that. Uh, when we look about a, 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 the, the environment of a cell within the body, we know that the rigidity is variable. There are areas, no, not, no offense taken, I mean the brain for example is a very very soft organ in terms of its not function necessarily but physical properties as opposed to bone which is about four or five orders of magnitude more rigid by, by physical criteria. So different cells can face very very different uh, levels of rigidity. The amount of molecules outside can be very different. So, so the molecules outside can be very dense or condensed or very, very sparse. Forces are applied to cells all the time. Just imagine, I mean, a cell in the heart is, is feeling about, about uh, 70, 80 to 100 times uh, a minute is being, being facing Contraction and relaxation, contraction and relaxation. Uh, when I move my hands, my muscles apply force to, to the skeleton. And the cells are facing a very, very strong mechanical perturbation. And there are uh, obviously also forces that are applied by the cytoskeleton, which I showed you in, in, in a couple of slides ago, indicating that the cell can itself pull on the environment and change the forces. So, so, so when it comes to the, the question of what is the mechanism, the mechanism is a very challenging field to explore because of the huge variability of most of the components that can affect cell behavior. So, so just to illustrate to you the chemical, the nature of the chemical variability. If you, for example, focus the question on a very simple, very simple issue. Uh, we, we try just to figure out how two different molecules outside the cell can affect the behavior. So obviously this is not as complicated as a real tissue that you can see here when you have a face here interacting with collagen fibers that can go in different directions and a lot of material between them that you don't even see here uh, that, that is surrounding a cell and the uh, collagen fibers you see over here, they are highly organized and very, very specific types of, of molecules, very rigid network of scaffolds that affect the cell behavior. But in order to deal with many, many materials, the cell also needs to have many antennas, many binding molecules, many receptors that can interact with the outside world. And in this particular case, the family of molecules that is providing the solutions is the family of molecules called integrins that are proteins made of two chains, alpha chain and a beta, beta chain. You can see here all the known combinations between alpha chains and beta chain that make these alpha beta dimers specific receptors for specific molecules outside the cell, like uh, fibronectin and vitronectin over here, which uh, have uh, an arginine, glycine, aspartic acid, uh, tripeptide that is recognized by the receptors, laminin receptors uh, that are uh, made by heterodimers in this region, and other molecules outside can be recognized. So the cell has, the cell is equipped with specific binding molecules that can identify and bind with different strength to different molecules outside. This is equivalent to our capability to have smell receptors in, our, in, in, in the base of our nose that can distinguish between different, different odorants that we can sense on the outside. Now the integrins are heterodimers that sit in the membrane. This is a membrane. This is the, these are the alpha and beta chain that you can see here. They have a short tail that protrudes through the membrane to the cytoplasm, which is located here. And when they are, and when you can see that they can uh, have a very, very wide 
combinations of alpha and beta chains, as you already saw before. And when they bind to the extracellular matrix, as you can see over here, they start to transmit signals to this region and they build an adhesion sites with many, many different molecules. We have sort of started to count these molecules and study them systematically and they are close to 180 molecules known today to be part of this structure. Not necessarily in all cells, not necessarily identical in, in all situations, and in all cases, but this is a big business, a big machine that is associated with adhesion sites. With adhesion sites, just a second. That that are uh, providing a connection between the external world and the cytoskeleton in this region. So, if we are, for example, now taking a minute to just to, for a reorientation. And if we are saying that we have here the extracellular matrix located over here, and we have here integrins shown here in a very schematic fashion, they bind to it and they link the cell to it. They can interact with some additional molecules in the membrane of a cell. But in addition, they can activate a whole variety of molecules that provide signals within the cell that regulate the differentiation and proliferation and survival and the adhesion itself and the spreading of a cell and the migration of a cell, all these features that the cell is maintaining. So this is an informative interaction. I mean, the interaction here is not just holding something physically, it's also sensing it and responding to it. Now I mentioned the different molecules may have different behavior and I don't know how well your eyes are trained but this is an example of taking exactly the same cell and putting the same cell on two types of surfaces. One surface is coated with one protein called fibronectin and another one with a protein called vitronectin. They are very similar in their function to each other, but they are not identical. And if you look what's happening to the cells, and, and you look at, at the cells over here, they are stained with different components of the adhesion sites, four components of the adhesion sites. I, I hope you can, you can figure out that, for example, tensin, paxilin, vinculin in a, in a cell attached to fibronectin are located in adhesions all over the place, the periphery of a cell and the lot in the center, whereas you have uh, the same molecules uh, when the cell is bound to vitronectin are mostly at the outside, less so, less abundant in the center, and the number of adhesions here is very, very high uh, compared to here. And the cells also spread more. They, they occupy more space. So the cell, in a way, if you put it on fibronectin or on vitronectin, despite the fact that it engages integrins, true different integrins, uh, and organizes cytoskeleton, the cells know, not know like the brain knows, but they, they, they respond differently to the two surfaces they behave differently and their fate will be different. You can see this furthermore over here. If we label for the extracellular component, you can see by, by superimposing uh, red and green that the adhesion sites do not overlap exactly the fibers in this case and they take another protein where the overlap is, is very high. So the cell have a mechanical uh, capability to respond to mechanical signals. Uh, force, for example, uh, the, the effect of force on adhesion. Now, uh, if I would sort of pose to you a question and I say, uh, I, I take an adhesion site, let's say that these uh, glasses are attached to the, through an adhesion mechanism to the table and I pull on it, what will happen? So what intuitively we think hap should happen is that I'll detach the adhesion, I'll break the adhesion, right? I apply force, I pull on it, no adhesion. This obviously will be a big mistake on the part of a cell because adhesion is made in order to resist such forces. So, so interestingly, there is a mechanism that we have seen some time ago in an experiment that I is demonstrated here. You take a cell, and you grow the cell on the surface, and you take a small pipette, 
uh, which is sort of smaller than the cell itself, and you pull on the edge of a cell. So if you wish, I mean, I, I, if, if the pipette is my finger, I make it a little bit wet, I put it on a cell and I pull. I pull like this. The question is, what will happen to the adhesions that are located in the pulled area? Obviously, when I pull on it, there is more force. In the case of the tablecloth, the tablecloth is just sliding on the table, but the cell is attached through adhesion site. What will happen to the adhesion site when they will sense force? You can see the, this is the beginning, this is the end. What will happen to those located here? And the experiment was done by a postdoctoral fellow that was working with a friend of mine, Sasha Bershatsky, and myself. Uh, uh, in 2001, you can see here the cell, you can see the pipette over here. You see very small adhesions in that particular area, and you see that when the cell was pulled, the adhesions did grow very dramatically. How do we know that they actually grew, and for example, not just simply stretched? They, they, we know this by measuring the fluorescence in this area, and the fluorescence here went up by a factor of about four. So it, it was really recruiting new molecules to this area. The adhesion site did grow. And that was since, since those experiments were done, many other experiments were carried out in which we applied force in different, different ways. Uh, that was done, for example, by working with cells that were located under flow and by looking at cells uh, the, in which we have actually uh, disabled the contractility of the cell itself and, and reduced by that the forces. And in all cases, when the force was reasonably, was a, bit, a little bit higher, uh, there was a growth of the adhesion as if the cell is resisting the detachment. So, so in order to preserve its function, there is a mechanism that allows it to grow and become stronger. Obviously, if we pull very strong on a cell, the cell will break and the cell will detach. But, I mean, some small changes uh, are not affecting, not providing this kind of, of effect. Now, there is a word which of, of, of some importance about molecular motors. I don't know, again, how much you ever heard about molecular motors. But uh, the body has many such molecular motors uh, that uh, operate in order to induce forces or bring certain parts of a cell, distribute them in the cell in a specific fashion. One of them has to do with the adhesion sites. And, and just to illustrate this to you, uh, I'd, I'd like to explain to you what you see and then I'll, I'll run the movie. You have, here you have a fiber of, of actin. The size, that's what I have. The size, the size of the, the fiber of actin uh, is running to very, very long distances. And this is ahead of a myosin molecule. These molecules interact with each other in muscle and in non-muscle cells. And uh, they, they if, and if I sort of run now the movie, you can see how the myosin is actually hopping on the actin. And by that is inducing contraction. Because the myosin itself is connected to additional components in its, in its tail. And it is moving along that act. And this is creating contractile forces that affect cell behavior in a major way. Uh, let me, since I have just a few minutes to finish, let me uh, just go quickly through uh, one, another, one additional feature and then I'll sort of try to sum up. And this is just illustrates to you how we sometimes import to biology technologies that come from completely other worlds. In this particular case, nanotechnologies that are developed for electronic uh, the, well, for, for physics uh, of different, different types uh, and, and in order to answer a question. So, for example, I mentioned to you that a cell, we believe, has a capacity to distinguish between an area that is full with molecules that it can recognize and an area in which these molecules are recognized in a very sparse fashion, dis distant from each other. Now, in order to test this in a systematic way, we wanted to place molecules in very, very specific locations on a surface to which a cell is binding. So this is a tiny piece from a, a, a surface which was decorated 
using a technology that I'm not going to describe in any detail uh, that places little gold particles. Each gold particle is actually smaller than an integrin molecule. So only one integrin molecule can interact with one gold particle. It will simply not provide space for others to be there. And I can place them close to each other or very sparse. Just to illustrate to you how this is done, uh, there is a technology that was developed in Germany uh, by, by a colleague of ours and by ourselves here in Israel. And we, we, you do this by using some polymers that determine the distance between the gold particles. You can see the gold particles located on a surface over here. You can make all the area between the gold particles uh, uh, in, inappropriate for cells to bind to. You can bind on the gold particles molecules that can be seen by, by the integrins, the alpha and beta integrins that you see here. And then you can plate cells and see what's happening. So if you look carefully, you can see that the cells are interacting with the gold particles and not elsewhere. And uh, you can see that you can have dense or sparse uh, particles. And uh, you can then look at the differences between the behavior. And you can see that actin is organized very well. Actin is red here. is organized very well when the distance is about 50 to 60 nanometers. But if you go to 73, for example, not much more, a little bit uh, greater distance, actin is, is when you, the adhesion is very inappropriate, not organized, not elongated as is, and not organizing actin in an appropriate way. And, and sorry. And, and if you try to see the efficiency of the adhesion, you can see that the adhesion goes from very high efficiency when there is high density to very low efficiency over a distance uh, which is very, very modest. So this is, of course, a very artificial system. You don't have such system in the body, but it gives you the feeling that the cell has a way of measuring a few tens of nanometers. So look, I will, I will now not dwell on the other issue uh, that is, I think, uh, an interesting uh, topic that we've been working on for quite some time, with, which is the rigidity sensing, the capability of a cell to sense soft, distinguish between soft and rigid surface, <coughs> which is very important. You can, I think, see the cells that are located on rigid surface polarized and organized acting very differently from those located on soft. Also, their differentiation is different, their behavior is different. And we were able, by deleting genes from cells, to find out which genes within the, within the cells are responsible with this transition from one type uh, to the other. Uh, so let me just sort of end with, with, with a challenge and, 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 and a closing slide. Uh, I've tried to demonstrate to you, to describe to you, the challenges that cells have in trying to understand what's happening around them and where, where they are located by sensing the environment around them. The machine, as we see today, are adhesion sites, the machine in which these activities are carried out. The complexity, the molecular complexity, is extraordinary. And what we know already now is that there are all these lines that you have in, in the scheme are indications for interactions or effects uh, induced by one of the molecules on another molecule over here. There are uh, at least uh, somewhere between 500 to 1,000 interactions that occur in the system which we know very little about. We know perhaps uh, in detail about 10 to 20 of those. And uh, within these molecules, you have molecules that organize actin, and you have receptors, and you have connecting molecules that connect some kind of cement that connecting these molecules together. We have enzymes that induce signals. And the mission is to figure out how all these are working together to form a functioning, uh, functioning organism. So, so uh, let me just uh, tell you that uh, one of the approaches taken is to try to develop new technologies that enable us to actually look at the adhesion site at the molecular resolution, which we have recently been able to achieve by a very unique type of microscopy in which we can see the area 
uh, at very, very high level of resolution, and we found that the interactions are mediated within these sites. So what you're looking here is a small part of a focal adhesion, and we can see these tiny structures uh, that are donut shaped, which are the linkers between the cytoskeleton and the membrane. We try to isolate them, we try to find out which are the molecules out of these 50 to 100 uh, that are located there. We try to study these complexes in great detail. We try to outline models that describe them. And, uh, and, uh, and in addition, and, and, and as a consequence, we're trying now to put all of this kind of information together. So what, what, what kind of message am I trying to leave with you at the end of this talk? So first, uh, to realize that cells have sensory capabilities, that they're capable of sensing the environment, and this is done for the benefit of the organism. This is what the evolutionary uh, uh, survival uh, is, is allowing. Uh, for biological processes. Then we realize that the functionality of the organism depends on this sensory function at the level of the individual cells. Then we realize that they can sense many different things. And the fact that they can sense many different things means that they are pretty intelligent machines in the sense that they have to integrate this information and being able to put it together into a decision-making process of how to respond to them. And all this part is a part that is still open and I believe will be open for a long time and will be a subject of intense research uh, that uh, I believe will persist long after you'll finish your studies in university. Those of you that will become scientists can actually um, I think enjoy having these challenges uh, in the work. Now, I, the slide that I sh showed you, I borrowed from uh, my research group here in lunch outside the lab, uh, and I'd like really to thank them for for uh, for the work that they've done and for taking part in this interesting journey into the mysteries of uh, the cell uh, decision-making process uh, and, and environmental sensing. So I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Geiger. Due to shortage of, shortage of time, we don't have time for questions. But, uh, and I think we could go on and talk about cell addition for a really long time. If you want to approach him, it's okay to come and ask questions. Sure. In any case, please, after lunch, we start our next and last session of the conference at, of the conference at 2 o'clock sharp. That means be there 10 minutes before. Okay? Yeah. 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 Yeah.